One term I've already put out there and will be throwing around a lot is this uh, concept of design domains. In fact, you need to understand these because uh, for your main assignment for this class, you need to pick a domain uh, in which you will design an artifact. Okay, and so I'm going to go over those domains, and these are classified really by um, communication arts. It's a magazine and a website that goes through and, and looks at uh, visual communication design across all of these different domains. So that's where these categories come from. This is what I've been using for years while I've been teaching this class and haven't found anything else really to go through and replace it. I think it's pretty accurate there as well. It's not uh, limited to these ideas. There's certainly other areas, but these are the main design areas that they recognize. The first one being packaging. And while that sounds pretty straightforward, um, there's uh, a lot of thought that goes into this whole concept of packaging, especially in tripping that persuasive switch that we have and to get us to pick it up, to, and to get us to, to look at it, read it, feel it, uh, and buy it, you know, later on. And we all have different switches, you know, in terms of what's appealing to us. But um, let's take a look at one campaign in particular. This is done by 479 Degrees. It's a popcorn uh, company. And 479 degrees is the temperature at which the kernel explodes. They started off in San Francisco, where they started with this uh, packaging campaign using these um, rectilinear square boxes here with the uh, design concepts of a white background with that uh, gray bar texture coming through and then uh, an image of the, uh, the product uh, on the side. Now, this is interesting. It, this is expensive popcorn, as you might imagine. It's about seven bucks, seven uh, fifty for a box of popcorn. But uh, people were buying these not just for the great popcorn that was contained inside, but also for the boxes themselves. They became collectors' items that way. But it proved to be too expensive for 479 to continue. And as they started to branch out and get into mass marketers like Target, they had to default to a different type of retail bag. This bag here, in terms of packaging, is probably the simplest one, uh, simplest and least expensive type of packaging that's out there because it seals at both ends. The bag goes down a conveyor, it fills with the product, it seals, it snaps, and goes on to the next bag, and so on. Eventually, um, 479 ended up with a uh, a bag that seals at the top, self-sealing, and then it has a wide bottom so you can set it down, it doesn't fall over because, you know, while you're eating popcorn, who wants the bag to be falling over all the time, right? So this is their final iteration of that. Now, you might not think that a lot goes into this whole concept of, of packaging, but the usability of the packaging uh, has a lot to do with the product and whether or not somebody's going to go through and buy it again. My biggest pet peeve when it comes to food is food packaging and, and or anything for that matter, especially blister, uh, plastic blisters drive me out of my brain. We're a civilized uh, culture. You'd think we figure out a better way to go through and package things up as opposed to plastic bubble packaging that we're using. Here's one that I think is pretty cool. It's a pasta package, NYC pasta, and it's uh, got a little insert inside the box that, so when you take it off, <laughs> you, you have this... Um, what is that, the Chrysler Building, Empire State Building, I guess, there in New York. Uh, here's one that uh, makes a little bit of a merger with a packaging uh, card that's behind it in terms of its sustainability uh, and what they're able to do with that. So packaging is one of those domains to take a look at. Another domain is this concept of identity. And many of you will tie logo or branding to this concept. And while that's close, they're not the same thing. And we'll get into branding and logos a little bit later on as we as we get further into this content. And identity is is probably the sum total of branding and logo and how that comes together. Um, the artifact I'm using for this is the California Academy of Sciences. Uh, not too long ago, it's been five or six years, um, they rebranded and uh, they built a beautiful facility. It's in the Presidio uh, of uh, is Presidio or Golden Gate Park, I can't remember which, in San Francisco. Um, if you get a chance to go there, it's pretty amazing to go through and, and tour the facility and see their their interpretive sites, which, by the way, is another domain. Okay, Exhibit is a domain, which we'll get to here in just a minute. But as you see here on the their sign, you see that logo. It looks like a snowflake. In fact, if you look at their other 
uh, artifacts, uh, that logo appears on just about everything. And the logo itself um, is significant because it lends itself to the identity of the California Academy of Sciences. There are, uh, first off, you have the snowflake shape of that, which is very uh, environmental in, in terms of its design. Uh, the color of this, you have three different colors happening. You have the green for uh, renewable environmental. You have the gray, which stands for the fog, which is a big resource in, in the Bay Area as well. Also a very cultural icon of San Francisco. And then you have the orange, that signal orange, and that happens to be the same color as the Golden Gate Bridge. Not accidentally. Okay, So that ties uh, uh, the cultural uh, artifacts of the area into the, the concept of the California Academy of Sciences. Now, the shape of each one of these arches is significant. If you looked on the rooftop of uh, the main building for the academy, you'd find that emulated. And what that shape does is it allows um, the rooftop gardens to concentrate moisture down into collection troughs that are at the bottom of each of these mounds, each of these arches there. So that's where that shape comes from. So all of this comes together in this identity then for the California uh, Institute of Sciences, or Academy of Sciences, not Institute. Um, another favorite Bay Area place is Yoshi's. Um, it's uh, an interesting combination of jazz and Japanese cuisine, and they did an update with their uh, collateral material in terms of their menus, their, their overall look, kind of harking back to um, uh, Japanese woodblock printing there to go through and, and create their logo that you see there, upper left-hand corner in the red there with that relief kind of printing happening within that. Um, a lot of the collateral carries over with different types of woodblock printing down in the lower right-hand corner. Their stationery, their letterheads, their menus, their business cards, anything that, that might be printing, okay, that goes through and establishes their identity. Now, collateral is another domain that we'll talk about here in just a minute. They've won awards for what they're doing, and, uh, and they've created a, quite a culture around their environment. They've opened up a second uh, restaurant in Oakland as well. So if you can't get in the San Francisco one, you have the ability to go across the bay, perhaps and get into their Yoshi's as that goes. Collateral, what I was just talking about. Typically, this is printed material, um, a business card, a, a three-fold three brochure. There we go. Um, anything that uh, you're using to communicate an objective to an audience that can be distributed via paper or something along that line. The, the collateral artifact I decided to use is this one. And while it might not look like anything, um, there's a story behind this. Now, you're familiar with the Academy Awards or perhaps the Emmys or the, uh, the Grammys, that kind of thing. And every season there is uh, um, there are the awards. But before the awards, the judges go through and take a look at the submissions, uh, the, the what they've been asked to consider um, in terms of what that product might be motion picture, it might be a television series, it might be a song, an album, whatever the case might be. And so these judges then receive different collateral material. This piece in particular comes from a, a television series um, called Burn Notice. I couldn't remember it. <laughs> it's called Burn Notice. And uh, if you know anything about the series uh, or even about the term Burn Notice, it's a uh, a term used in covert operations when somebody is terminated, they get a burn notice. And uh, the show is about a CIA agent and, and what goes on that way. So this collateral was sent out to those who consider uh, material for Emmy nominations. All right. So w once you got the box, you opened it up and you found this trifold kind of contraption going on. Notice there's nothing printed in there except underneath the flashlight and underneath this, there's instructions there that says one to use the flashlight and two then to deny ever using the flashlight. But if you do, if you turn the lights off and you use this flashlight, it's actually um, a UV light and, and if you shine it on it, then it goes through and, and reveals all the text and that is burn notice. And then it shows you the contents of the DVD series that's in there. Very clever. Even though burn notice was a terrible series, the, <laughs> the, the presentation of this was, was pretty ingenious to go through underneath the, the culture and the guise of covert operations in the CIA and blah, 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 that kind of thing. 
Uh, the city of Milwaukee did um, a collateral engagement with their uh, with their citizens there um, because there were some serious mortality rates in terms of childbirth and prenatal care, those kinds of things. So the city, along with their community centers, uh, put together a, a beautiful co uh, collateral campaign along with uh, with uh, print ads and such to go through and raise awareness, but to do that on a cultural level that would draw their audience in, it wouldn't be off-putting to them, and it would give them the resources that they needed to go through and get the kind of prenatal care that uh, that was warranted. And, and they did that by tapping into um, a value system of uh, equality, as you can see that's a bit represented here. So collateral, uh, printed material to go through and, and uh, exact a communication objective there that you're looking for. Print can be part of that, uh, but print really, well, back in the day at least, it was its own um, domain uh, for in, in terms of print ads. So we're not doing a whole lot of that anymore. We're doing it online in perhaps the same type of... Um, uh, design and the same type of layout process that were that's going online that once existed in magazines. But here we're talking about magazines. I'm going to show you a couple of uh, campaigns that are double truck campaigns, meaning that the ad appears uh, with a scene you know, on both pages. You turn a page and the ad is on both pages there in terms of print. The first one was for a specific audience in, in uh, Delhi, India. And the uh, the company here, the product was uh, washing it was laundry machines. Uh, Videocon was doing this. Um, this particular part of India happens to be one of the filthiest, dirtiest places out there. And uh, the campaign here was to go through and do kind of a cultural juxtaposition in terms of what clean means. And so they did this series... The first double truck was of this uh, garbage truck dumping clean laundry, uh, as you see in this in this vast field. So instead of a uh, waste uh, landfill, we have laundry fill going on, kind of this juxtaposition. Then you have this uh, sewage concept, but instead of raw sewage coming out and pouring into the rivers, you have clean laundry. Or this one in terms of air pollution, um, you have this billowing clean laundry going on. The, the campaign was wildly successful. Um, lots of units sold to go through and, and, and address the socially awkward kind of, we really don't want to be known for this kind of idea, but it, it worked. Um, in, the, in Northern Europe, in the Netherlands, uh, a, a, an American company, a very well-known American company, Alka-Seltzer, started a campaign. This is a double truck ad as well. And they ran a series of this together. And I don't know if you can make out what's going on here, but you'll see as the series progresses, you have this story that comes up, right? And what's cool here, what's happening is you have this figure ground separation going on with just a little bit of a soft shadow underneath the figures and then total gray, you know, in the background, but it gives them some separation and focuses you right on, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the main foreground elements, the main design elements that are going on. So here you have the mob, uh, the guy's got a Tommy gun and it's pointed at uh, the, the little guy. And then you have kind of an x-ray thing going on. You can see inside of his stomach. And in his stomach is the uh, is the loot, okay, is the money. And so up in the upper right-hand corner, plop, plop, fizz, fizz, right? I was also just going to go through and help him out. So here's the series that they did with this. There's this one, <laughs> which I think is hysterical. This one just uh, totally cracks me up. If you can't figure that out, you can come back to it and take a look at it again. That's a telephoto lens that he has that he's on a camera that he's swallowed. Or this one here that uh, kind of speaks for itself. Um, very clever, very funny there. And uh, these became kind of collector's pieces for people, uh, in, especially in the design world. Um, Revlon decided to capitalize on this whole double truck concept in terms of print. Um, I've never colored my hair. I don't have much hair to color, but uh, I understand that getting it down to the roots is kind of difficult to do. And so Revlon goes through and demonstrates this using the gutter. That's what that's called, that scene between two pages. Using the gutter in a magazine to demonstrate the effectiveness of their product in terms of how it gets to the roots. Now, this is just an image, right? But it... it it shows the idea, it demonstrates the idea that uh, their hair coloring gets down to the roots. Pretty cool. Next is Exhibit. And this is probably one of the least uh, 
appreciated domains. Uh, there's a lot of money to be made here career-wise to get into exhibit, especially in trade show exhibit. And if you happen to live in southern Utah, um, we're just a few uh, hours away from the, the biggest trade show exhibit design uh, capital in the world, which is Las Vegas. There, uh, the, the biggest trade shows across the world are held there at the Las Vegas Convention Center. And there are lots of agencies in that area that do exhibit design. And this is a big deal because we're dealing with three-dimensional design um, that uh, as people enter and get into, they're, they're having an experience all the way around it. And so it's a lot, a lot more than just two-dimensional types of uh, approaches in terms of laying things out and using colors and textures and things. This becomes compounded by it being three-dimensional. Jay Lindbergh um, is a clothing company and uh, they do a lot of trade shows. And in doing so, it's um, I used to work uh, I used to work for Chums. I used to be the general manager of the eyeglass retainer people, and we did a lot of trade shows as well. And hauled all of our our garments and our uh, eyeglass retainers and the, the the dummy heads and things like that. And we had to set them all up and take them all down, haul them back out to the truck, and that kind of thing. Lindbergh's doing the same thing, but they um, decided to take a, a real practical approach in the design of their trade show booth by actually using a shipping container as part of their booth. So really all they had to do was bring in the shipping container and unpack it, create the floor, put the container back on that, and then go through and decorate it and put it together. And then at the end of the show, everything goes back in the container, a forklift comes and picks it up, and boom, they're gone. Um, very practical, uh, very aesthetic though as well in terms of the its industrial nature of this and how that factored into a sales environment um, for them on their floor. Um, car dealerships uh, are great places to go through and, and see this concept of exhibit, museums as well. Um, uh, any place that is, is a learning type of environment use um, exhibit approaches as a domain to go through and, and uh, get their communication objectives covered. Converged media. This is a combination with the, with the, how do I even say that? I, if I say the emergence of the World Wide Web, it's almost ridiculous because it's not emerging anymore. I mean, it's, it's cemented in our psyche as the main place that we go to for most of our visual communication with what's going on. Converged media is taking things like a, a billboard and a magazine ad and maybe a bus stop bench ad that's on the, the, the back of the bench um, and putting a website there, okay, a URL there, and then combining that then with, uh, with the actual website. So you're using a number of domains to point people in the direction of their website. Um, one of the most successful campaigns that's out there was done in Scotland, and the name of the campaign is This Is Not An Invitation to Rape Me, which also happens to be the URL. It's a very long one, as you can imagine, and, um, and it's a little on the edgy side, as you can see. This is not an invitation to rape me.co.uk. What this campaign was all about was to go through and turn the tide of thinking of people in Scotland, over a quarter of the people in Scotland felt that if a woman dressed like this, or if she were engaged in a situation like this, or like this, or even like this, and if she were raped within those contexts, she deserved to be. So they realized, um, the, the folks putting together this campaign, that this kind of thinking had to stop. Okay, this kind of rape culture had to be addressed. And so these images that you're seeing here showed up on uh, bus stop uh, pagodas, uh, on, on the metro, on trains, uh, all around all of the villages and, and cities of Scotland to go through and educate folks in terms of what was going on. And the URL pointed to this website, which was consistent with the visuals that were used on those other campaigns. Uh, go there. Check it out. Still up. Okay, and you can go through and, and it starts to educate the user in terms of rape culture and where no means no. And in fact, um, yes is what it is that we need to have before anything can be encroached. I don't even know what to say. Before anything can happen after that. Okay, um, This has been up long enough to where the research shows a very favorable turnaround in terms of attitudes in women and rape culture.
This is what visual communication really is all about, is making that kind of connection. The next design campaign is <laughs> domain is the campaign. Duh. And and not to be confused with what we just saw, this is not an invitation to rate me is a campaign. Okay. They are pinging different environments, different contexts, okay, it's physically, especially psychologically, socially, and culturally, to come together and realize their communication objectives. In this case was to raise awareness. Um, about rape culture in Scotland. By the way, this was a Los Angeles design firm that did this campaign, which I find to be fascinating because we, never, we haven't seen anything like this in the United States, which I believe probably has the same rape culture issue. Um, the campaign I'm going to show you here was for a, uh, a zoo, if I recall, and they started off with real road signs showing prehistoric animals crossing the road, and then they got into... Uh, uh, printed um, direct mail pieces, uh, invitations to the show. They put out uh, video uh, commercials and things and did uh, brochures. They printed up T-shirts for the docents of the uh, campaign that was happening here. Uh, and then they got into sign material. They got into vehicle wraps and they got into billboards. Here we're seeing a, a pillar wrap. Uh, all this comes together then as a campaign to uh, reach the communication objectives of the client. And here, that was to get people to this uh, exhibit starting, it looks like on uh, May 24th, uh, this was a few years ago, but to get people involved and get them into it. You are going to be part of a campaign as your final project for this class as well, where you'll take something, each of you within your group will be responsible for one particular artifact from one domain and put that together into a campaign to reach a specific communication objective with your audience or with your client, as the case might be. Next is motion. Uh, and uh, getting into motion picture, I'm going to throw out some videos uh, that you need to see, you need to watch in conjunction with this um, that, that talks about it. One of the artifacts that I use is an ad by Nike. Um, these are stills from that. Within the ad, we see this uh, eventual clash that's going to happen. Make sure you look up. I'll post it up as the as the Nike ad uh, for de design domains. And I'm going to use some other video as well to go through and, and show you what I'm talking about. Of all the domains, um, the motion domain is probably the most difficult um, the most sophisticated in terms of all the design elements that come together, everything that we're using in design and all the other domains come together in motion picture production. And uh, but due to the kind of the limited contact nature of, our, of this class, I think, gosh, I can't get into this as much as I want to. And I'm very passionate about this. But I'll put up other video that goes through and, and talks about um, design concepts in, in motion picture. So those are the, the domains. Make sure you understand uh, what they are. Um, not a bad idea. Like I keep saying, to go back and watch the video again. Stop it. Start it. If you have any questions, uh, you know where to find me. All right.